Right, fantastic. Thanks very much, everybody. And thank you to the entire CHOC team, the extended CHOC family for your patience today. Um, we, this is the second time today that there's been an issue with Zoom links. So my profound apologies, but I welcome you to Snosis First Thursday and thank you all very much for a very important conversation around the support of brain tumor survivors in, in children in particular. So that's enough from the SNOSA team, myself and the, and the rest of the steering committee, but I'd like to hand over to Audrey Ludwig from CHOC, who's going to introduce her team and start what I think is going to be a fantastic conversation. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, and um, welcome to everybody. We're very excited about this day and that we can have this conversation. So on behalf of SNOSA, the Society of Neuro-Oncology for Sub-Sanara Africa, Prof. Alan Davidson, Prof. Jeanette Parks, I welcome you to this first Thursday education series um, for continued medical education in all aspects of neuro-oncology. My name is Audrey Ludic. I'm the Program Development Manager for Child Child and Cancer Foundation, and it is my honor to be um, the host to this conversation today. It would be very interesting to know where you're all from. So if you want to, you can put your, your name and the place where you come from in the chat. And um, you're also very welcome to put um, any questions that you might have in the chat. And um, hopefully afterwards we will able, uh, we'll be able to address um, your questions. So um, one of the most difficult times for families post cancer treatment is the integration of the patient with brain tumors and patients with cognitive challenges um, and differences back into society. After a lengthy exclusion from society, patients experience many difficulties, cognitively, socially, spiritually, um, and there are many uncertainties and unknowns for the brain tumor survivor to develop and adapt as a socioeconomic independent individual. It is important that families and communities understand the new journey and to have the resources um, available to assist the survivor to make informed decisions about their future. If we want to advocate for the brain tumor survivor, we need to understand the challenges they experience when the survivor needs to integrate back into society. We need to know what kind of resources are needed to ensure that the patient adapt cognitively, emotionally, socially, and physically in the society. We also need to understand what could be done alternatively should resources not be available? Because in South Africa, we are privileged, but it's not always um, everywhere the case. And lastly, we need to find ways to collaborate and advocate for patients with brain tumors to make the integration into society easy. So today we are going to have conversations with different people to understand their journeys, challenges, and to try to find solutions. There's not going to be um, presentations, we're going to talk. And um, today we're going to talk to Karen Bain. She's a bereaved mother to Georgia, who passed due to a brain tumor. We're going to talk to Prof. Kathleen Thorpe. She's mother to Fiona, a long-term um, brain survivor. Lawrence Mabuyani is truck social worker and board chair of the hospital school at the Chris Arne Baragwana um, Academic Hospital with a special interest in a special needs education. Amy Dolman um, is our neuropsychologist working in the pediatric um, neuro-oncology clinic at Grutteskir in the Western Cape in South Africa. And lastly, our CEO Chuck, uh, um, from Chuck Hitley Lewis, will conclude the conversation by sharing some ideas around CHOC's post-treatment support program. So our first speaker, and, and thank you to everybody for being here. I hope you're going to find this very informative and very interesting. Our first um, speaker then today is, is Karen Bain. Karen um, and her husband are two very special people. They are the founder members of the CHOC Cows, um, that is now a fundraising arm of CHOP. And they raise funds by um, having fun 
through um, sport events. But um, Karen and Grant's journey has not always been that easy. So Karen, um, welcome very much. Please unmute yourself. And, um, and thank you for being part of the conversation. So uh, Karen, please share with us your journey um, with Georgia. Thank you, Audrey. And thank you for including me in today's discussion. Um, so lovely to see everybody in the room. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start and, and good thing I made some notes. So sorry, I've got my glasses on and I may glance down just to check and I'm glad I did make notes because it's amazing how much happens and how much you actually forget about until you to you zoom back in. So, so Georgie, our daughter was diagnosed at the age of seven uh, with with a brain tumor. Um, her diagnosis fortunately was quite quick because what happened was she was playing and she bumped her head um, and got a bleed on the brain. The, the tumor was quite large at that stage. So um, fortunately, and I say this because I understand the journey, it's not always uh, quick, certainly with brain tumors and any other type of childhood cancer. Um, so she was, she was diagnosed in uh, 2017 and she was seven years old. So that's her grade one year. Um, she, she went on to have, oh, sorry, of course, my mom would phone me at this very moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, she went on to have a surgery, um, followed by radiation and chemo. She did exceptionally well. Um, I was actually just thinking back in terms of when she went back to school and she went back to school three weeks actually after her, her surgery. So, I, I was absolutely blown away by how kids handle brain surgery and how, um, you know, the, also the radiation and the chemo, she just literally skipped through it. Um, a lot of it, I should say, not all of it. And towards the end, definitely, it definitely did get harder. Um, she was, it was towards the end of grade one and, and they moved her. The school was very kind because they realized what was important was actually that she stayed with her peers. So she moved through to grade two, even though academically she probably shouldn't have. Um, but they, the very nurturing, loving school that realized that it's really important that she stays in an environment that's supportive and loving and socially, um, that that's a good space for her. Um, Sadly, her, her after the surgery and the, all of that that she had, her cancer did return. She had two clear scans. And then in early 2019, uh, her cancer returned. Um, and she had further surgery and further radiation. But, but unfortunately, it was, it was too, too much. Uh, the cancer had spread quite um, significantly across her brain. And she passed away just short of 10 years old. So she was um, nine. Um, yeah, and her journey was absolutely incredible. She um, yeah, was very feisty throughout and um, really taught us how to experience joy and, and live in the moment. It was the greatest blessing. Yeah, I remember that feistiness of her when she challenged me at school when I did a talk about chalk and she, she was very adamant um, to challenge me on, on a question. <laughs> Karen, um, what was the biggest challenge um, challenges that you as a parent experienced when you were looking for an educational home for Georgie? Yeah. Um, so the, I thought about this quite extensively because the one is in my mind a lot bigger than the other, but there are two, I would say two categories of challenges. The one would be more the financial logistical challenges and the other are more the emotional challenges um, that I experienced. And, and the financial and logistical are all as a result of additional therapies, um, OT, play therapy, speech therapy, and probably various other types of um, therapies that are specifically required to um, assist to assist your child getting back into to the education or mainstream if it's possible um, or any any form of education and then other than that on the financial side is obviously the the schools that are available have smaller classes more one-on-one -on -one, um, teaching which obviously adds to the cost from 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 a yeah, costing point of view and then also logistically so the logistical challenge of where the school potentially is um, I know for myself I um, I 
I had to take quite a lot of time off work, but it was fine. I worked for myself. So it's quite a challenge for a parent or the caregiver because you have to be quite close and, and with your child throughout many, you know, many of the journeys, many of the therapies. Um, and that can be challenging for, for anyone who works in an office or, or works for, for someone. Um, as I said, I was lucky that I worked for myself. So that's, that's almost like the smaller problem, I would like to say. The bigger problem, as I saw it in my mind, is really the emotional side. Um, and, and a lot of that comes down to accepting this new world. So you, you're thrust into this new world and um, you've been shifted completely out of mainstream or education and now you're in this new space um, and you're grappling to understand it yourself um, and you're grappling to accept it potentially depending on the personality that you have, um, particularly a type, but not so much anymore, I was then. Um, so, you know, you're driven and you want things to, you want your child to get the best and you want them to, um, you know, uh, the results and all this kind of thing. And all of that is, is actually your stuff. It's all your own things, not your child's. But unfortunately, as we are as parents, we want the best for our children. And sometimes we unknowingly do um, put that pressure on our children. So, yeah, I think acceptance that it's now a different um, route that you're taking. And then also um, the second guessing. There's a lot of second guessing of, your, of the route that you've chosen, uh, whether it's a school or the therapy. There's lots of advice coming. Who do you trust? How do you trust um, a particular um, specialist? Um, and then worrying about your child, are they secure? And how long do you wait to see that there's progress? Um, you know, what, what can you expect? And there's really no roadmap because every child, every situation is unique and is different. Um, but I think what I really found the most important is that children learn when they are happy, um, when they're secure, when they feel um, that there's love and acceptance, respect and dignity, that is when they learn and that's when they're at their best. And I think every choice you make and everything you do, if it's tested on that basis, is this in the best interest of my child? Do they feel loved, accepted, nurtured in this environment or, or what we're doing here? Um, that that's for me quite an important thing in terms of testing whether you're making, because you'll never know. You'll never know whether you're making the right decision. And, and that's that's quite hard. Thanks, um, Karen, for sharing that with us. Um, what would you say was the biggest challenge for Georgie? <laughs> well, she she made it seem like there were no challenges. She she didn't really have many challenges, but I would say that probably the social side, and every child is going to be different. So I have extremely um, social children and they just yeah so she missed her friends from her old school from St Peter's um, and St Peter's was amazing because they said she could go back anytime she could go join the netball team she could go sit in the class she could just spend time so she got a bit of a she could dip into that environment and then um, she went to a smaller school caliber where she actually was um, you know more one-on-one -on -one teaching so the social side um, accepting that she was different um, but she was young, so I, I don't think it was too obvious to her, but I mean, they know, they, they're very clever. Um, yeah, and really fitting in. I think that's, that's really a challenge. Yeah, yeah, there's so many challenges to the children. Um, and then my last question to you is, what do you think is needed to support children like Georgie? Yeah, um, I think it's from a parent point of view is to really understand your child. And, and what I've seen certainly post COVID is a lot of people have got to know their children a lot better, just in general, in terms of how they learn, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And I think that's really important, knowing what, knowing your child well, um, because when a child is happy and the anxiety levels are low, that is when the learning is going to happen. Um, so for me, it's, it's understanding your child and then, potentially having places to go or resources, people to speak to about what are the alternatives, what are the options. Um, maybe support groups could be something that could, could help around this or, or other parents who've been down similar roads. Um, it, it, it is good at the same time, it's, um, you know, you don't want to, because a lot of advice, there's a lot of advice and it's a lot of information and you've got to kind of synthesize all of that into something that's useful for you. So yeah, probably a combination of understanding your child really well, uh, support groups, 
Um, and then maybe some information, whether it's from organizations such as Chuck, in terms of what are the steps and just some guidance around how to, to go about this new phase. Thank you, um, Karen. Um, thanks for sharing the journey with us. Um, you know, we, we always will remember Georgie as the feisty, very special little girl with the blonde curly hair. And um, thank you that, that you took part in the, in the conversation. Please don't go away. There might be questions afterwards and then we will direct it to you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. So our next speaker is Prof. Kathleen Thorpe. She is Emeritus Professor in Languages at the University of the Witwatersrand and mother to Fiona, a very, very special girl. Fiona um, is a long-term brain uh, cancer survivor and um, yeah, also another little girl that is very deep in my heart. But um, Kathleen, welcome to the conversation and um, thank you for, for being here today. Please share with us um, your journey with Fiona. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for including me uh, in this discussion. Um, well, um, I can only echo what, what Karen said in a lot of ways, and just perhaps to amplify it on it uh, a little bit. Um, each child is different. Um, as the uh, neurosurgeon said to me, it's not so much what your child has in the way of a tumor, it's where it is, because that's going to determine um, a lot of, of what you will do later. Um, well, Fiona was diagnosed uh, with a pilocytic astrocytoma um, on the cerebellum, just very near the brainstem, just before her sixth birthday. And um, she had um, the operation, she had radiotherapy, she had chemotherapy. And we're talking about 1996. She was one of the first children to have um, chemotherapy uh, included in the um, in the treatment, and the the staff at the then Joburg Gen, the Charlotte Machike Hospital, were absolutely wonderful. Um, our journey has been full of ups and downs, um, from dealing with anxiety, school problems, um, the um, importance of uh, trying to uh, create some sort of social integration for her. Um, and also the fallout from the treatment. Um, Fiona was unfortunate. She lost the hearing in her right ear. And uh, through the radiation, she had progressive hearing loss in her left ear. So um, some years afterwards, she was able to have a cochlear implant. So um, that did uh, prevent her from going completely deaf. Um, her journey and our journey together has been full of therapies, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Um, as Karen pointed out, you spend your life running from one uh, therapy to another. Um, you get a lot of advice. Uh, uh, most of it you can ditch um, because people uh, will stop you in the street. It's amazing. And give you advice um, unsolicited. And um, some people mean well, others um, seem to be very afraid of, um, of uh, the idea of cancer as if it's somehow contagious. And um, they, especially brain tumors, because um, your child might look different, they might walk differently, uh, they might uh, slur their speech, but it doesn't mean they are unintelligent. And um, the best thing one can do uh, uh, that I found um, on our journey was just to be as honest as, as possible, uh, because children do have um, uh, what one could call a sort of BS antenna. They can pick up when you're not, uh, not being completely level with them. And uh, they have a wonderful resilience. I'm amazed. Um, the children uh, showed that they somehow got through the treatment without feeling sorry for themselves. And um, it's, uh, I think they're a pretty good example um, to, uh, to everyone, really. Uh, they just accept the situation and get on with the job. And uh, that's been my experience of Fiona. She doesn't let herself be stopped by, by obstacles. We'll either ride over them or go through them or get round them, <laughs> but somehow we manage. Yeah. Fiona is a very special girl and very direct and very honest. <laughs> um, 
What was your biggest challenges post-treatment to find a place in society for Fiona? Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges was finding an appropriate school. Um, when she was diagnosed, she was in grade R and in, at a small private school, and she insisted on going back to school as soon as possible. Uh, it was a couple of weeks after, uh, after surgery. And um, although uh, she wasn't always uh, feeling particularly well, she was just being there, just belonging. Um, that was one of the most important um, things. And it was absolutely devastating for her when at the end of grade three, well, she was, uh, um, uh, wasn't keeping up all that well. And it was made very clear to us that somehow she was holding the other children back. And therefore, we should consider um, taking her out from the school. She was absolutely devastated. Um, and um, then uh, it was suggested we try a remedial school. That uh, was not particularly a particularly happy choice because there they have children to fix them um, to go back into mainstream teaching. And my child did not need fixing. She just needed teaching. And when you have a children, uh, when you have children to, uh, who have behavioral problems and who have learning difficulties, uh, they aren't necessarily the best company for your uh, your child who just needs patience and um, a lot of understanding. And um, so that didn't work out particularly well. Um, and then it was another school was suggested, which was a school for retarded children. This I uh, visited and decided, no, this was not it. Um, the, uh, your best friend there is a, an educational psychologist to find out where your child is, what they're capable of, and so that you don't expect too much, but also you don't expect too little from your child. And um, so uh, while I was casting around for other solutions, um, I homeschooled her for two years uh, because I did not want her to be put in a situation where she'd be humiliated or badly treated. Remember, we'd be talking 26 years ago, <laughs> it's quite a while, um, and um, treated badly with um, other children coming up to her and saying, my daddy says you're brain damaged. You know, that sort of thing um, you, you need to, to actually steal your child to cope with. And... Um, so um, eventually, uh, uh, just simply by chance, a neurologist suggested Hope School, which is a special, uh, was a so-called special school, but for physically disabled children. And that was a very happy choice to start with, uh, because they're the children, uh, uh, there you have children without arms, without legs, they all manage and um, the, Fiona fitted in, in, in beautifully, but then um, the education department decided to uh, require the school to take in children with behavioral difficulties and learning problems, and this changed a lot of the dynamic in the school. So the last few years weren't quite as happy as they could have been. Your child needs order too. And then outcomes-based education hit her as well, which meant that um, things got very bitty and uh, uh, she didn't do as well as um, she would have done otherwise. She did pass matric. Um, she repeated one class, uh, grade nine, and uh, she had two goes at matric, uh, just repeating three subjects. Anyway, she did pass. She got a matric certificate. That is amazing. What a beautiful story. And I always see uh, Fiona, but I never realized um, I knew there were challenges, but I never realized there were so many. And well done to you as a mom for fighting for your child and, and getting her to the right space. So um, where is Fiona now in her life? And tell us about the challenges that she overcomes. Well, um, the challenges were, first of all, um, what was she going to do with the rest of her life? Once, she, once we'd passed matric, that was that we could leave behind us. That was done and dusted. Um, then what to do next? And um, she's always loved uh, um, uh, uh, small children, and she's been very creative um, as well, making things, playing games, um, doing all sorts of things like that. Um, anyway, um, so... Um, I found a small um, private uh, child uh, 
early education um, uh, institution and uh, booked her in there. Um, they weren't particularly welcoming because she'd been to a special needs school. This is the stigma that you deal with after having been to a so-called special school. Um, anyway, if she stuck it, I, I, I'm afraid I became a rather horrible person, probably. Um, I'm sure the headmistress director uh, used to curse every time she saw me, but Fiona stuck the courses and she passed. She got all her certificates. Um, after that, um, she decided she wanted to do it more and she registered for, uh, registered for early childhood development courses through UNISA, where she did very well always getting very nice remarks for her practical work, et cetera. And we were looking for a, um, a, some place for her, perhaps in a small um, nursery school as a grade R um, um, a, 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 a teacher's assistant, and then COVID struck. Um, so that put, put paid to that. Then um, came um, uh, last year, she unfortunately had a stroke. Um, which she's recovered from fairly well, but we're still trying to find out the exact cause of, of the stroke. But in the meantime, she's very busy. She's um, very creative, as I mentioned. She writes delightful children's stories. Um, and uh, The Old Cat and the Kitten is one of them, uh, which she illustrates with collages and poems. And uh, Piccadilly, the Silly Caterpillar, is the next one coming down the line, which we hope to introduce to people sometime. That sounds absolutely amazing. Um, and, and well done. I think um, knowing Fiona, it, I just take off my hat to her to, to, for her achievements. And I'm sure you've also been instrumental in helping her. But in your experience, what do you feel she changed in our <laughs> educational system? to accommodate um, the brain tumor survivors? Well, in, uh, first of all, um, in the education um, department, looking up the uh, their mission statements, et cetera, they pay lip service to inclusivity. Um, there are very few schools, I think, in South Africa, whether they're private or government schools, um, that uh, have the type of facilities that would uh, um, accommodate um, uh, children, perhaps, who have balance problems, don't cope very well with stairs, for instance. Um, also, classes are far too large. Um, and uh, also, the teachers just simply are not trained and equipped to, uh, to deal with children who deal with anxieties. Um, every before, after the um, post-treatment, remember, it's another five years uh, of having regular scans. And the old anxieties come up. Um, every time um, a scan is due. Of course, the jubilation when the scan is good is, is, is wonderful. Um, but uh, there are those sort of things going on. And um, one should look perhaps to countries like Australia, where um, they do their very best to keep children um, in the mainstream. The class of teaching classes are smaller, and also those children are taken out of, um, uh, of the class every now and then and given special attention in areas where they're struggling. And I think this would be a wonderful thing for us if we would uh, not exclude, um, exclude our brain tumor children, but include them. Because um, just because they've... Uh, developed a brain tumor doesn't mean that they somehow less than they used to be or worth less or less deserving of attention. They belong um, in, in society and uh, they should be treated as such. Uh, oh, I, think of, I think one of the most uh, sort of heartbreaking moments was um, year, when, when Fiona was very little, um, I, She'd, she'd see me give a donation to, to uh, I think it was Avril Elizabeth home or something they were collecting. And she asked me why I was doing it. And I said, well, that's for God's special children. And then um, after um, she had her operation, she asked if when she was barely able to talk anymore. And she said, Bomber, am I now one of God's special children? She is definitely one of our very special <laughs> children. Um, just in closure and just in one minute, what is your dream for your child for Fiona? 
Well, what I would like for Fiona, and, and I'm quite realistic, I'm a total realist who believes in miracles. Um, I would like her to be able to do something meaningful with her life, possibly earn an income of some sort. It doesn't have to be a lot, but your, her feeling of self-worth to earn something would be would be good. And um, I don't think she'll ever be able to live independently. I don't know. A miracle may happen. But um, that we we find a place that, um, that she'd be happy in one day. But um, mainly it's to do something that gives her life meaning, that gets her up in the morning. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen. I think there are so many um, so many things that we um, as advocates can really um, advocate for when it comes to our brain tumor children. Um, thank you for sharing that beautiful story with us. Our next speaker is Lawrence Mubuyani. Lawrence is um, one of our CHOC social workers working in the pediatric oncology unit at the Krishani um, Baragwana Academic Hospital in South Africa. He is also the chairman of the, um, the board of the chair of the hospital school at Barra. And Lawrence has a heart for education and a very special interest in um, special needs education. So Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I want to ask you, when a child is diagnosed with a brain tumor, it ultimately affects daily activities, including school attendance. Open communication with the child's school is essential from the beginning. What is your experience when you contact a patient's school? And what are the reactions when you say that you now have a brain tumor child that need a place? Um, thank you very much for having me here, Adri, and greetings to the colleagues who are attending the session. Um, we should take into consideration or we should be in cognizance that a, a child doesn't live in isolation. He or she is linked with social structures in the community of which one of them where he spends most of his or her time is the school. So when a child is diagnosed with brain tumor, it is very much important that the hospital or the hospital link person that in our case would be me or mom, Ida, my colleague as social workers, you need to be in contact with the school where the child is attending. Reason being is to assist the mainstream education school to prepare necessary documentations as well as progress reports of the child so that they can be sent together with the child to the treatment center or the treatment hospital, because in those hospitals where these children are receiving treatment, we also have um, what we call hospital schools, whereby they also continue with their learning activities. So if there is a constant contact and communication between the two parties that are involved, which is the hospital schools or the hospital, as well as the mainstream education, it allows a smooth transition of academic activities from the mainstream education to the hospital schools. However, uh, in terms of uh, the response that we normally get, uh, we should be cognizant again that uh, a child spends most of their time in, in the schools and automatically they develop a social bond with the staff of which in most cases it becomes with the teachers who they interact with on their day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So in this case, during the process of um, bond development, there are emotions involved. So if you go to the school or you are in contact with the school to inform them that uh, the child is diagnosed with brain tumor, there comes a sense of great shock and disbelief from the teacher's side and the supporting staff, but it does not only and there, it comes in most cases or being accompanied by a great feeling of sadness as well as empathy towards the child and the family and everyone around the child. So that's what we normally experience when we are in contact with the school address. Yo. So um, one of your roles as the child social worker is to assist survivors to integrate back into society post treatment. Is that the easy job? 
Um, I cannot say it's an easy job, Adra. It, Adri. It is uh, challenging because remember here we are dealing with a, a child and where a child throw his or her self-esteem or source of his or her self-esteem is the physical appearance of, of which is how they look in the outside world. So in a case whereby a child is diagnosed with brain tumor as part and processes of the treatment, at some point they will need to undergo surgery in some in most cases. And those surgeries do not, they are not in the most hidden places in the body, but in the most uh, 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 um, in the most uh, most cases they will be in the face so if a child sees himself that now the physical appearance has changed from what he used to be to what he is now due to due to the, the surgical operations that he or she has undergone automatically that child will have his or her self-esteem impacted so in that case that is where we as social workers or psychosocial support team of CHOC come in. We provide counseling and support and we empower that child so that he or she can be able to go back and face the community. As we know that the community will not be lenient as me and you, but will be asking very sensitive questions as to what has happened to you. So we prepared that child so that whenever he faces the community can be fully, fully empowered. However, at the end, everyone who's in the session, the focus is not only on the child because we do not want to create a, a dependency syndrome, if I can put it that way, that this child and the family depend on us on continuous counseling and support to the child. So what we normally do is we capacitate and empower the primary caregivers or the family of the child so that they can continuously provide the support and counseling as well as empowering the child on day-to-day -day basis since they are, they, are, they are the immediate support of that particular child. So in that way, it also assists in terms of smooth transition from the hospital environment and back to the community. Um, I think we can never ever under, underestimate the, the value of the um, multidisciplinary team working with a child um, diagnosed with cancer or with, with a brain tumor. Um, I want to ask you, most brain tumor survivors need special needs education. But some survivors can cope, some survivors can cope very well in, in mainstream schooling. I mean, uh, we have many examples of, of brain tumor patients that post-treatment do very well. They marry, they, they have businesses, they have lives, they do very, very well um, in society. But you know, what about the in-between child? I always talk about the gray area, the child that doesn't need to be in a school for special needs but can't cope in the mainstream schooling. In your, in your experience, what do you feel Sonosa and Chuck need to advocate for when it comes to this in-between children? Thank you so much, Adri. Uh, that is a very important question. Um, we must note that um, the right to education is the fundament, fundamental aspect of the children's right and is backed up by the Children's Act to say, every child has a right to education. Be it they are under treatment or post-treatment, those children have the right to receive education. So in this case, what Chalk and Sanosa needs to advocate for is to ensure that during the entire process of uh, medical treatment, the children are receiving uh, the necessary education, just like any other children are receiving education who are not currently on, on, on treatment. From the loopholes that uh, I've re recorded or I've, I've notified in my duration with talk, I've realized that there is a gap in terms of communication or a relationship between the mainstream education as well as the hospital school. So if Chalk can play a role, Chalk in collaboration with Sanos can play a role of a, a, a broker role in terms of ensuring that there is a strengthened relationship and collaborations between the mainstream as well as the, the, the education, I mean, as the well as the hospital schools. That can assist in ensuring that 
all children, be it on treatment or not on treatment, receive education as per it, uh, it's outlined on the, the children's right. So I think both organizations can advocate for the right of education to all our kids. As uh, Fiona's mom indicated that he, she noted that uh, in most cases, there is no proper systems in place in ensuring that necessary schools are available to ensure that all the children uh, diagnosed with brain tumors are catered for. So that would be even a start line to say, we need to advocate to ensure that the schools that will be able to cater for children who are diagnosed with brain tumor are available in the societies, be it in the township, uh, in towns and urban areas and rural areas, we need to ensure that these schools are available since these kids are everywhere in the community. It's so sad because um, hospital schools are seen in the, in the uh, education sphere uh, with the Department of Education as a luxury and they never know where to place the hospital schools. But the value of a hospital school in the life of a, a child that is on a long-term treatment or long-term um, uh, post-treatment, it is very, very, very important that we give in the hospital quality education to the children and also that there is a communication, as you said, between the school and the hospital school and the parent. So coming to parents, educating um, parents and families about the child's diagnosis and treatment options will allow the parents to make informed um, decisions about their child and to be better advocates for the uh, survivors of brain tumors. In your opinion, what um, skills and knowledge do parents need and how will they get the tools to advocate for and support their children to be welcomed back into society. I know it's a mouthful, but can you can you give us a, 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 your idea on this, please? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question, Adri. Um, we must also uh, take into cognizance that by virtue of being a parent, their parents or the mothers or the families or the caregivers, they possess necessary skills, knowledge, and uh, uh, capabilities in terms of ensuring that the child is taken care of. So what we need to do on our side is just to polish and enhance the skills that they already possess, more especially when it comes to the medical aspect and the treatment aspect of the child. Most parents, they lack the necessary information as well as knowledge how to continuously provide care and support to this child. So that is where we need to come in and capacitate, give the information to this uh, families as well as the, the mothers. So fortunate enough, in our unit, in our unit, we have measures in place or we have systems in place in ensuring that the parents are well capacitated and they get the information they need around the diagnosis, treatment protocols and all that through the handbook that CHOC has provided that is available in the hospital. For every newly diagnosed patient, we give that handbook for parents so that they can read on their own and come back if they have questions. So that book is in a very simplified manner in a way that even a person who doesn't have a higher level of education can fully understand around the diagnosis. Like for instance, if it's brain tumor, their person will be able to understand what is brain tumor, how is it treated, and how to provide care and support to the child during the entire course of, 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 of treatment. So I think in that case, at the end, everyone in the session, it will be very much important that such materials in the treatment centers are available so that the parents can be fully equipped and fully knowledgeable about the diagnosis of, of the, their children as well as how to provide support to, to the children. And lastly, as I've indicated that we are fortunate enough, uh, CHOC has recently established a um, a digital support program for teens, there is where the teenagers are able to talk about different diagnoses, more especially about brain tumor, talk about their diagnosis and other elements that are affecting them and be able to exchange information based on their level of understanding. So that platform also creates an opportunity of having more information to the child as well as 
to the parents. So I think in this case, when it comes to the units where chalk is based, there are systems in place in ensuring that the parents are being capacitated. But I would appreciate that nationwide, everywhere, where there is an oncology unit or where brain tumor uh, patients are being treated, such system can always be in place so that the parents can be well informed and knowledgeable around brain tumor. Thank you, um, Lawrence. Um, we really in appreciate your wisdom and the experience that you, you brought uh, to this conversation today. Yes, um, I'm very proud of Chalk's Parent Handbook and it is on our website available. Anybody can download it and, and read it. Um, the Canadian Brain um, Association also have very valuable um, information specifically for brain tumors, for the caregiver, for the families. Um, we wanted to, to do a book, but then when we realized how, how wonderful uh, they have done the, the documentation and it's all online, um, that we didn't have to redo anything. We could just use the information. So our next speaker, um, at the second last speaker today, is Amy Dolman. Um, Amy, welcome to this conversation. Amy is a, a mirror. Yeah, you're so welcome. I see you've got no shading, so I hope you your batteries will last. <laughs> um, Amy, you know, Amy is a, a is a neuropsychologist working um, at the pediatric um, neuro oncology clinic at the Hrithuskir Hospital in the Western Cape, one of the nine provinces of in South Africa. For our international guests. Um, welcome to this conversation. We're so glad that, that you are with us today. And please tell us, what is the role of a pediatric neuropsychologist? <laughs> Thanks, Audrey, for the introduction. So a neuropsychologist, um, we are someone that um, identifies, assesses, diagnoses, intervenes with different psychological disorders in um, central nervous system dysfunction. So, you know, with brain spinal cord. Um, and the importance, you know, our, our role really is to um, understand what impact a brain-based condition, such as a tumor, um, has on um, the brain's cognitive functioning, um, on the, the patient's emotional functioning and their behavior. Um, so, you know, as, as a neuropsychologist, I would um, go through a patient's medical history um, to get some background information on what condition they've had, um, what their, you know, their treatment has been, um, then assess them. So assessing as part of the assessment, you, you, you look at um, history from, from the parents, you look at developmental history, you look at, you know, you ask about what difficulties are currently um, uh, identified by the parents, by the child, by the school, um, and then assess different functions. So for example, attention, memory, processing speed, those sorts of things, and use that to, to identify where a patient's strengths and weaknesses are um, in order to intervene in the correct way for them. Um, and then, of course, the psychological aspect as well, the impact um, psychologically on the patient and the uh, family as well. Oh, that's a mouthful, eh? <laughs> um... How important do you think is the, the role of the multidisciplinary team in the well-being of a brain tumor survivor? I think we've heard so much, but from your perspective, um, and do you think that would be great for, for every um, uh, oncology unit to have such an MDT? I think I am extremely spoiled to be part of such an amazing multidisciplinary team. Um, so as part of our clinic, we have um, um, oncology um, present, um, whether it's the consultants or registrars or um, representatives from the department, from neurosurgery, from radiation oncology, from endocrinology. Um, and it is really, it's my um, time the last couple of years with that I've been with the clinic you know, it's just amazing to see how every person um, contributes a little bit to um, a patient's care. 
So, and, and this is, you know, this is even before referring out to other members um, of the team, you know, so the oncologist can, you know, they, they're there to tell us about the treatment. Oh. Amy, unmute yourself, please. Oh, sorry, um, I'm not sure where, where, where I got left off, but um, <laughs> just, to, just to reiterate, you know, with, with oncology, you know, we get to learn about the patient's um, treatment protocols, uh, any side effects, and they get followed up with oncology. For radiation oncology, you know, you get to learn about the patient's, um, again, their treatment protocols, how much radiation they receive, where it was, you know, where they were irradiated um, and as you know when you get radiation and treatment to the brain you know the centers um, uh, looking after the hormones in our body get affected so a lot of these children have deficiencies for example in growth hormones and the endocrinologists are there to monitor those different factors which can also have a huge impact um, on on a child's um, life so we all, um, and then of course, you know, when the children come in, we, we chat about school, how they're doing, how they're coping, how the parents are coping. Um, so that is just our little team of, um, and sorry, and the neurosurgeons as well, who review scans and, uh, you know, tell us about the, the patient's shunts, which, which is to prevent blockages of fluid in the brain. So everyone really contributes to the treatment, the management of the patient, and then we still get to include other um, important people, for example, social workers, occupational therapists, speech therapists. Um, everyone has their own specialty. And to combine all of that, um, you know, is, is really helpful for a child, you know, because it's not just about um, surviving a brain tumor. It's really about having a good quality survivorship. So the quality of life of the patient going forward. And as we've spoken about reintegrating into schools, reintegrating into you know, the post hospital or treatment life, um, there's many factors and they get you know, followed up for, for many years um, and for everyone just to play their role um, in addressing different issues that come up. And as, you know, as has already also been discussed, how every patient is different. So, it makes, I think, a huge difference to patients when, um, when they have a team. And also, it's very reassuring to parents and, and caregivers, you know, when they come in and they, they know that there are various people there for them, uh, whatever, you know, whatever situation may come up. Yeah, that is so true. Um, but you are very privileged um, at Rutherski to work in, in such an amazing multidisciplinary team. But you know, poverty and the socioeconomic environment in countries play a huge role in, in, in the post-treatment of, of a child. And not every treatment center has an MDT or a neuropsychologist. So what would you recommend to treatment centers who have these patients, but who do not have these um, services available? Well, certainly from a neuropsychology perspective, the, the field is generally very young compared to many other fields, uh, certainly in South Africa. And I, I know, um, you know, even more underdeveloped in other parts of, of Africa um, and, you know, poorer parts of the world. So, you know, from that perspective, um, there's different ways in which to, um, manage um, the the patient. So if you know if there is a, a neuropsychologist available, you want to um, make the best out of the resources you have available, which may mean you know being um, tailoring your assessment um, to you know so that it's not too time consuming. Um, that you look at specific things. Um, at, you know maybe identifying children who need the assessment or to prioritize who needs assessments and train um, using in terms of like the resources sort of moving uh, where possible to shorter test batteries um, computerized test batteries um, or screening measures those sorts of things so now of course you know there's not always a neuropsychologist uh, involved but that also you know there's 
other clinicians and therapists um, have knowledge of a lot of the difficulties that um, a lot of the neuropsychological difficulties that patients present with. Um, and there are um, screening measures or, or other sort of self-report tools that can be used um, by other clinicians. And it may be that particular children need to be identified, um, whether that means to refer them onto a sort of more primary-based um, uh, hospital care, that might need to happen. Um, you know, I'm just thinking about some of the kids that come to our clinic. They don't even live in Cape Town. They live outside of Cape Town. So there are times when if they come for their appointment, I'll coordinate with that. So they don't, you know, so when they're in town, um, I'll see them at that time um, and just sort of trying to make the best use of resources. And I think um, the other perspective is, as you know, as we all know, um, COVID has given us this opportunity to develop this online online platforms, um, and that can be quite helpful as well. You know, I've I've had quite a bit of experience with how uh, in in different areas with different teams from um, different parts of the country getting together and discussing cases, discussing um, patients and management. Um, and, you know, so it's really connecting with others, being willing to share your knowledge and resources with, um, with other teams um, and guiding them where possible. Um, so, you know, you, you sort of have to make the best of what you can do and be willing to help others who aren't in as fortunate position um, as you are. And then, of course, be willing, if you're not, you know, in the position, if you don't have the resources to, to ask for it and sort of advocate for you know what may be available and as you said um with the the virtual life that we at the moment experience um the the global community is very small and we can really reach out to each other to ask for help and to um to learn from each other my last question to you is um children and young adults who survive a brain tumor and are now carrying on with their lives may have side effects that remain with them over a long term, or they may develop late um, side effects that manifest uh, weeks, months, even years after the treatment. What are some of these challenges and what coping skills would you recommend to assist the survivor to cope? So I think, you know, some of these um, uh, challenges have already you know, being mentioned, and I'll just sort of recap, you know, we've got the emotional challenges, the anxieties that come um, with uh, going through a disease like this, um, and treatment, and, um, you know, waiting for scan results, and, you know, um, there's the emotional side of things, and the impact, you know, being out of school for very long, the having to go to treatment on and off, the stress of the um, the treatment and you know the drain on on financial resources for the family. Um, then we've also got the, the cognitive side of things um, where you know you get the cognitive aspects are you know dependent on the location of the tumor, uh, what treatment um, patients received. So, you know, those that have received whole brain radiation versus more focal radiation, you may see a difference in their presentation. Um, you, get, you, you, you get also late effects from treatment. So, you know, you may not see difficulties, cognitive difficulties early on, um, but these tend to um, uh, emerge over time um, as, as the late effects sort of come about but also as the the child goes through life and goes through school and there's more demands on them so you'll see you may see more challenges come up um, from that perspective um, and there's you know behavioral issues um, as well that um, can come about and you know some of these you know uh, you can get direct and indirect effects. So, you know, we, we have the effects of the tumor, we have the effects of the treatment, but the indirect effects are just how much um, all of this has um, a psychological 
impact, the social impact to the family. And I think it's already been emphasized that, you know, it's not just the, the patient that is affected um, by the tumor, it's, it's, you know, the family as well. Um, and identifying and addressing the family challenges and the stresses that come up with that, you know, whether it is um, more financial stress that has come out, whether it is, um, you know, difficulty in finding an appropriate school for a child. Um, there's, you know, all these different aspects that come into play um, in terms of uh, reintegrating into society and to be able to, for the child to reach their potential. Um, and, you know, the, the issue of special needs schooling, um, whether it be within a mainstream environment or whether it be um, a specific special needs school, you know, we don't have enough. There, there's just, you know, the fact of the matter is there's not enough of those types of schools uh, for, for our patients. So from a neuropsychological perspective, trying to identify what exactly uh, is deficient with the patient, what exactly are the difficulties, um, and using that information in order to help place the, the child more appropriately, um, implementing practical uh, interventions, you know, whether it's just that supporting the need for um, extra time for, a, uh, for a exam or test, um, whether it's educating the, the teachers, um, you know, a lot of the time it's been really helpful for parents who um, just chat to the, the child's teacher and for them to just know what's going on. Um, that's really helpful and that sort of carries on year, year per year. Yeah. Um, those are some of the challenges that, that we see. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Amy. I think just from this conversation, we can have many more conversations that unpack some of the, the challenges and, and find solutions because at the end of the day, we really want to, to, to help our brain tumor children to become at the end socioeconomic independent, um, you know, uh, children and adults contributing to, to society. So that is really what we would like to see. So thank you for, for your, for your um, participation in this conversation. So our next um, and our last speaker, and we have um, like 12 minutes. Hedley is, is the CEO of, of CHOC, um, and we are very proud to have him as our CEO. Hedley, welcome to this conversation. Um, and and I, as the CEO of CHOC, I want to ask you um, also, CHOC is a growing organization, um, and we try to stay on par with the global trends. Um, our new strategic plan of CHOC, CHOC includes a post-treatment support program. Can you maybe tell us about more about this and why you think this is important for NGO also to play a part in the role of, of uh, the children post-treatment? So thanks so much, Audrey. Thanks so much for Sonova, not for just being the medical fraternity that actually treats, uh, but that opens open, honest and and informative conversations. I think that part of advocacy and education is hearing from a mirage of individuals, from survivors, parents, to, to the fraternity, to the different multidiscipline people. For Chuck, it's about saying, well, we, 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 we are very cognizant and, and our mission and vision currently has always been about the treatment and how to augment the medical fraternity while the family is going through the, the really rough, tough journey. And I think if you're having a look at, uh, you've heard from, from Lawrence, you, you've, you've heard from some of the parents, the journey is, is an anxious, it's a stressful environment. And for us, it's about saying, well, if we want to support the, the full complement from diagnoses to, to, to whatever the journey should be, but we can't just stop when the child is, is, is concluding their treatment. We have to continue and say, well, what, what next? How do we prepare them for the next stages of life? And similarly, how do we help and assist to become a family-centric organization to assist the families? 
And, and I think that's what our new strategic document is going to um, have as an additional element to, to previous strategic strategies that we've had. Thank you, Hedley. Yeah, I think we have a lot of work to do and a lot of planning <laughs> to do. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And we agree that this can only be done through collaboration, like days, to, uh, like this, a day like today, for example. Our community of brain um, tumor advocates are very unique. They are very passionate and determined to see improvements in survival statistics for both adult and pediatric brain tumor patients. So how can we work collaboratively to advocate for our survivors? Well, I think that what we've heard from today is that, that it's not just the hospital, it's not just the medical fraternity. Uh, if we're looking at education specifically, uh, we need to advocate and communicate with departments of education. When we're looking at financial burdens of survivors and looking for specific remedial education, should that be needed or occupational therapies and those type of allied therapy benefits, it's important for us to be working with Treasury to see how we can um, support families with, with possibly getting tax rebates and, and supporting in that methodology. I think if you're having a look at these families go through a lot of anxiety, stress, and the one thing that is really um, the common theme today is that every child deserves an education and that regardless of a child's illness or how sick they are, constitution, they deserve that too. So we as a country need to step up and we need to unite. So it can be government departments, it can be schools, it can be hospitals, um, it can be the public to say that, that, that it's not just good enough for us to call ourselves the, the rainbow nation because we are transparent and we work together in color, race, color and creed. We need to be in a true inclusive environment, whether there is uh, disability challenges, whether there is children that have got uh, disease. And, and similarly, if they post disease, how do you reintroduce them back into educational facilities and make sure that those opportunities are available to these families? I mean, when you're having a look at it is some of these families are, are, are on different areas of, of our country, from rural to high income. And we need to make sure that regardless of the depths of these families' pockets, that they can get these opportunities available. I think that we've seen is that every child wants to play. Every child actually wants an education. They want to learn. So why should we not give them that opportunity? I think that if you're looking at, we have to strengthen the, the, the relationships. We have to say that that no matter where they are in that journey, we need to be there. One of the things that comes to mind is to make sure that the likes of uh, neuropsychological neuropsych and social um, practitioners and professionals are, invi are involved and, av and available in all our hospitals, not just certain hospitals. We need to make sure that, that, the, that the highest of skills are available, um, whether it's in rural townships or whether it's in tertiary institutions. We need to we need to advocate, we need to educate. And similarly, those overflows need to go from, from treatment centers to educational facilities, whether it's teachers, headmasters, or, just, or even the pupils themselves could, could get an understanding of exactly what the challenges and how to become an inclusive environment, possibly even in the class. So for us, there, there are lots of talking points. There are lots of educational opportunities. There are lots of advocacy opportunities. And I think the one bigger myth about advocacy is that it's not just about talking to government. It's talking about stakeholders across. If we want to say that we're a multidisciplined organization, multidiscipline doesn't just include the medical environment. It's an environment of total inclusion. So for us, it's about saying from the beginning to the end, how can we augment the medical fraternity, the educational environment, and then to the families on their continuous journey. For us, it's about saying that we truly need to be a rainbow nation of not just color, race, color and creed, but an inclusive environment, regardless of the challenges of our South African people. Thank you, Hedley. And then my last question to you is, um, what is your big dream? for brain tumor long-term survivors? I, I think that, that the dream is, is always going to be total inclusiveness. People that understand and they're not ostracized. They are included. They are 
are warmly invited into environments. And for us, it's about bringing people into an environment as opposed to creating stigma, which creates ostracization and sadly increases the anxiety. Let's rather reduce the anxiety to give these children the opportunity for education. Let's reduce their the anxiety around the family and let's give them the opportunity for these families to rise and, and for, to have a full opportunity in their, in their journey, uh, whether it's in education or employment or just playing a role within our society. Thank you, Hedley. Um, that was, was a great end to the conversation. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I don't know, I didn't get any questions in the, in the chat. I don't know if there's anybody who would like to, to share. Um, you could put up your hand. And um, Alan, I don't know if you can manage that from your side before we just close. Sure. Gosh, and my camera's right in my face again, so I apologize. Um, long story. Uh, I, there's a bit of a backstory here, guys, that I, I'm so pleased that we didn't have some kind of, like me, some kind of brain specialist on this panel, because this conversation was fabulous, because it underscored what Teddy Totemer, as a neurosurgeon from Ghana, um, said earlier, that the, the, you know, the, the medical stuff is, is, obviously, it's fairly key in in one sense but it's only a part of the story and without all of this there, there isn't actually an end to the story and i'd encourage welly to share because i don't know if anyone i don't know if everyone read those comments that would be really useful but it's just that for a variety of reasons because of the SARP meeting and other things many of the doctors that were approached weren't able to help so eventually audrey just threw up her hands and brilliantly we didn't have to sit through pictures and all you know and long medical explanations um, and it just goes to show that the, on the one level you need us but on the other level the multidisciplinary community that extends beyond the hospital is pretty self-sufficient too there's some amazing skills here and it is about bottling them and also as I want to say from my from my side I want to echo Headley's sentiments. It's also about scaling them to make sure that everybody can access them. And that's really tough. You know, so centers of excellence are nice, but they're only nice if everyone else gets a splash of excellence too. Anyway, that's my five cents. Thanks. Um, Alan, don't go away because there's a question in the chat. God, I'm running the meeting, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is the one thing the doctors can do to make the landscape even more inclusive in Africa? Well, you know, you what you it's interesting, exactly the, the 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 fairy dust that Amy spoke about, which is absolutely insist on multidisciplinarity. So it can start with many things. So, for example, I'm looking to see there's Teddy on the call and and the president of Snow, Sir James Belogan. And you know, a long time ago, guys, I used to send my residents to spy in the neurosurgery wards. I don't need to now because the relationships are different. But I used to send them and say, if you see new patients, go, let's go find them, you know? Now, there are places where in various, you know, silos, people don't talk to each other. So it starts with a cup of coffee or tea or whatever, you know, whatever it takes and a tumor board um, and a conversation. So the medics all have to talk to each other. So already you have, um, you know, the, the on the treatment side, the neurosurgeons, the radiation oncologists and, and oncologists, pediatric pedonks, but on the input side, from a diagnostic point of view, you need great pathologists, you need good radiologists. It's a whole story. And then people like Amy are absolutely crucial because, you know, treating a young child with an embryonal brain tumor, which necessitates craniospinal radiotherapy, means that child has got very little chance of, 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 of um, moving into mainstream schooling. That's hell of a sad. It's it's the price we pay because without that treatment, there's no prospect of cure. But Thank you. with Thank good you. input from lots of people, it's you can get amazing results. But you need to get in early. You need to make sure those kids are accessing the right schools. So you have to have an MDT mm. with a dog. Thank you, Alan. Um, 
Yeah, I fully agree. I, I fully, fully agree. Thank you for joining and thank you for all the conversation and, and for the inputs. Thank you for the panelists. I'm not going to repeat your names, but I really am very thankful to all of you for, for your participation. If you um if you want to refer a child, um on the on the chalk website and um, www.chalk.org.za, there is a refer button. Um, we will also on our events page um, put the, the video recording of, of, this, um, of this wonderful webinar. But on the 30th of November, um, Prof. Alan Davidson will do a CPD accredited talk on uh, to healthcare professionals, to doctors on the early warning signs of childhood cancer um, uh, of, excuse, uh, sorry, on uh, pediatric brain tumors and the early warning signs thereof. So you are welcome to click on um, the events page and then register for this very um, informative um, webinar. So from all of us, thank you for joining us and let's work together to, to um, ensure that our children with brain tumors receive the best, best, best that they can out of life and become the wonderful children that we know they can become. Thank you so much for joining. Go well and have a good evening. Okay, thanks, thanks so much for a fabulous okay. uh, symposium, guys. Really appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.